If you have a Bible, and I, I hope you do, let me invite you to find with me Matthew chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 28. What I want to do is uh, look at these two passages of Scripture and think about over the course of two messages, uh, what is a disciple and what does it mean to make disciples? So we're in kind of this series on key terms and definitions when it comes to understanding mission, which is significant on one hand, yes, for missionaries around the world who are proclaiming the gospel in places where it's never been heard. But this isn't just for missionaries. This is for every one of us as followers of Christ, because as we're going to see today in the next message, and even as we go deeper into these terms and definitions, mission is not just for a select few people in the church. Mission is the purpose why we're all on this planet. And so we need to think about key terms and definitions in mission and how the Bible, how God and his word defines these terms like gospel. So we looked at that a couple of messages ago. And what does is, what is the Bible talk about as the gospel? And tried to look at the core truths that are the center of the gospel. And then in the last message, we looked at evangelism and conversion. So what does it mean to proclaim this gospel? And why do we proclaim this gospel? With the aim of persuading people to repent and believe, turn and trust in Christ, to be converted, to go from being outside of Christ to being in Christ, with Christ, Christ in them. And so that's what we've looked at so far, gospel evangelism conversion. Well, that conversion leads people to be disciples. So what is a disciple? And how do you make one? Since this is what Jesus has commanded us all to do. Again, not just missionaries around the world, but every single one of us has been commanded to make disciples of all the nations. So how do we make disciples? And we need to know what a disciple is, and then we need to think about what does the Bible teach when it comes to how to make one. So Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 through 22, what I want us to do is I want us to read Jesus' initial interaction with some of the men who would become his first disciples. I want us to read that initial interaction with them at the beginning of Matthew, and then I want us to turn to Matthew chapter 28 and read the last interaction he has with them in this book uh, before he ascends into heaven. So his initial interaction, his last interaction, and in the process, I think we're going to see a pretty clear picture of what it means to be a disciple and what it means to make disciples. We won't dive into both of those in this message. We'll look at the first, what does it mean to be a disciple? And then the next message, we'll dive into what does it mean to make disciples. So Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 says, While walking by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. So that's initial introduction to discipleship, what it means to be a disciple, in Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Follow me, Jesus says, I'll make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and they followed him. Then, so that's his first interaction with them. You get to the end of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28, and Jesus gathers together with those four disciples and seven others at that time. Eleven disciples went to Galilee, Matthew chapter 28, verse 16, to the mountain to which Jesus directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. All right. So with these kind of bookends in the book of Matthew, let's think together. First, what does it mean to be a disciple? What I want to do is kind of unpack it here and then think all throughout Scripture, particularly in the New Testament, but really all over Old Testament and New Testament, what does it mean to be a disciple? And I mentioned in the last message that there's a document 
that kind of expands on this that you can find at Radical.net with all kinds of scripture footnotes and references. You can dive in deeper on all these levels. But if you were to say, okay, what is a disciple? How, how would we say scripture defines an answer to that question? Well, here's the best attempt that I would put before you. So disciples are fundamentally they're followers of Jesus. They're people, men and women, who have turned from their sin and trusted in Jesus as their Savior, which is exactly what we looked at when we talked about the gospel and conversion. So Mark 1.15, repent and believe the gospel. Romans 10.9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So these are people, disciples, who have turned from their sin and themselves, trust in Jesus as their Savior. They've died to themselves and surrendered their lives to him as Lord. You think about other passages here in the Gospels. Luke chapter 9, verse 23 through 24, when Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. If anyone's going to be my disciple, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. He must die to himself. They've died to themselves and surrendered their lives to him as Lord. Think, think about Galatians 2.20. Maybe one verse that sums up the essence of discipleship better than, well, many others. When Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I've been crucified with Christ. I've died to myself. I no longer live. Christ now lives in me. The life I live by in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Disciples, followers of Jesus who have died to themselves and surrendered their lives to Jesus as Lord. So think about that imagery. I no longer live, Christ lives in me. This is the essence of what it means to be a disciple. So for a disciple, Christ now lives in them, which transforms everything about them from the inside out. And all of that leads to what I want us to talk about are six primary marks of a disciple. So the first mark that we're going to talk about is a transformed heart that occurs at a point in time when a disciple places their initial faith in Jesus. And then the rest of the marks we're going to talk about, those other five marks, are found in increasing measure as a disciple grows through faith in Jesus as a member of his body, the church. So if you were picturing this, I want you to picture it almost like it's concentric circles. So concentric circles kind of starting with a small circle at the center and then a circle outside that that's a little bigger, circle outside that that's a little bigger, outside that, outside that. So six, picture six concentric circles. And I hope on a variety of different levels, this will be helpful as you think about not, not just what it means to be a disciple, but when we start thinking about what it means to make disciples and help people grow in Christ, that thinking about concentric circles in this way will be helpful. Because what I want to show is how the life of Christ taking root at the core of who we are begins to transform everything about us. And as we become, Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, we become followers of Christ. That foundation, I'm a follower of Christ, with Christ living in me, that begins to transform everything about the way we think and feel and act and relate to others and think about our lives and our very purpose in the world. It all starts with the core reality of Christ in us. And that's what happens. So what I mean when I talk about the core circle and, and this mark of a disciple happening at a point in time is we've got to think about what happens when uh, someone initially becomes a follower of Jesus. They receive a transformed heart. So if you were writing down so six primary marks of a disciple, the first mark would be a transformed heart. So disciples at their core, at the core of their being, are spiritually regenerate. They've been forgiven of their sin and are now indwelled by God's Spirit. So this is, again, fundamental essence of what it means to be a disciple. To be filled or be, be indwelled by God's Spirit, forgiven of all your sins, having a new heart, Christ living in you. So the first mark of a disciple is that he or she has been forgiven of their sin. You just think about that. Let that soak in. Like all your sin, all my sin, all of our sin before a holy God is totally forgiven. He remembers it no more. He doesn't count our sin against any of us. And then, as if that were not enough, 
not only has he forgiven us of our sin, but he has put his very presence, his spirit inside of us. We were talking about this last week when we talk, in the last message when we talked about evangelism. But you think about it, the spirit of God dwelling in us by supernatural grace through faith in Christ. We have been forgiven of our sin. We're now indwelled by God's Spirit. God the Father looks at us and He says, you're totally innocent of sin. You're dressed in the righteousness of Christ. And not just forgiven of our sin, but adopted by Him. He is our Father. We're His children. This is an awesome thought. That God has not only as judge declared us righteous before Him, but that He has as Father welcomed us into His family as sons and daughters. I think about uh, my kids. So two of our kids are adopted. We uh, tried, longed for, wanted for many years to have children and the Lord wasn't providing in the way we hoped. And uh, so the Lord led us down a path of adoption, which if I would have said anything at that point, we probably said, well, this is kind of second best. Uh, since we can't have children biologically, we may have to I guess we'll just adopt, and that'll be kind of second best. We learned real quick that adoption was just as best. And so we had the joy of adopting our first son, uh, Caleb, uh, from Kazakhstan. And uh, we got back uh, from adopting him, and two weeks later, I found out that my wife, Heather, was pregnant. And so we were shocked by that, uh, surprised. Um, and nine months later, along came Joshua. Obviously, we knew at that point we were able to have children biologically, but we also knew we wanted to adopt again. And so we ended up starting an adoption process that led in a roundabout way to about three years later us adopting our daughter, Mara Ruth, from China. And we got back from adopting her, and three months later, uh, my wife was pregnant again. And so along came number four. Her doctor said, oh, so if you adopt four, you'll have eight kids. And we're like, ah. So uh, anyway, we've, we, we have seen walk through the process of adoption in our family and seen the joy of it, but also seen confusion behind it. Like I remember when we first brought Caleb home with us, so the, our first son who we adopted, and a lot of people around the, the community where we live knew that we uh, had adopted. So sometimes we would be somewhere, they would notice Caleb, and we would tell them the story, and they'd say, oh, that's so nice. Now, do you have children of your own? Which is uh, phrase number one, not to say to an adoptive parent. Do you have any children of your own? So I just wanted to say, well, you come here real close. Like, uh, don't tell anybody, but he's our own. Uh, so it doesn't have to be biological to be our own. They say, well, you know what I mean. So yeah, I, I know what you mean, but you're almost, it's almost like you're saying that he's not really ours. Like, uh, this is... And so people would say to me, like, well, or to Heather, uh, my wife, they'd say, well, have you ever met his real mom? And I just want to say, well, yeah, let me introduce you to her. Her name is Heather. She's standing right here. So she's real mom. I remember uh, when we were preparing to go adopt him, I told one person, uh, we're going to go adopt a child from Kazakhstan. And their response, they just immediately said, I wish this wasn't true. Uh, I was exaggerating. This is, this is exactly what they said. They said, we're going to adopt a, a child from Kazakhstan. And they said, a real one? I was like, uh, no, no, we're going to get a plastic one that we can put on our mantle and look at it every day. Of course, we're going to adopt a real child. So anyway, a lot of confusion that people would say about adoption. People would ask us, were you ever going to teach him about his family heritage? And it's like, well, yeah, we're going to teach him all about his family, cultural heritage, it may surprise people that our children know a ton about their family heritage. They know all about their granddad, my dad, who never, they never actually had the opportunity to meet, but they've, they've seen pictures, heard stories. One of their favorite videos is the grandpa videos. He knows, they, they know about their, their other granddad, their two grandmas, cousins, aunt, uncles, aunts, great aunts, great uncles. They know more about their family heritage than they know what to do with. And even cultural heritage. They've read books by... Dr. Seuss, and they run around the house saying, run, run, fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm the, I'm guessing you know how that, that line ends because you've got the same cultural heritage, and they know all about their culture's foods like fried chicken and mac and cheese and watermelon and birthday cake. They know all about their musical heritage. Like they may not be able to identify the Kazakh national anthem, for example, with Caleb, but he grew up in Alabama, and he knows Sweet Home Alabama really well. So he knows, they know a lot about their family and their culture because they're in our family. 
and they're part of this culture. Now, it's not that we, we minimize the culture they came from or even family they have. Yes, we talk about that, but at the same time, like they're fully a part of our family. They're, they're fully plots. Like they, they belong in our family totally as our son, as our daughter. They're not aliens or strangers in our home. They have family with heritage. So all that to say, kind of come back to this picture that we see in Scripture of adoption. Do you realize? So what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. You're a son or daughter of God. He is your father. He loves you as his child. What an awesome thought. J.I. Packer wrote in a great book called Knowing God in his chapter on adoption, which is just an excellent chapter. He said, what is a Christian? He said, the richest answer I know is that a Christian is one who has God as father. If you want to know how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, it means that he does not understand Christianity very well at all. Oh. So disciples have been acquitted by God the judge, adopted by God the father. That Gracious regeneration of their hearts has triggered a glorious transformation in every disciple of Jesus. We've been brought from death to life. We're new creations who now live as servants of the King, heirs of His kingdom. We're empowered by the Holy Spirit to grow in holiness as God gradually transforms us into the image of Christ from one degree of glory to another. All of this while we hold on to the sure hope of full and final future glorification with Christ. Oh, there's so much there that we could unpack, but I just want to put out there the reality. When you turn and trust in Christ, you become a child of God, a servant of the King, heir of the kingdom, empowered and dwelled by the Holy Spirit of God, now in a process where you're growing into the image of Christ. That is the first mark of a disciple. You have a transformed heart that then changes everything about you. So let's start to work this out. So that's the first mark of a disciple. Now think about how that affects, well, second, a transformed mind. So your heart, new heart, new life in Christ, then begins to affect the way we think. So disciples of Jesus have a transformed mind. They're biblically grounded now. They believe what Jesus says. To use language from John chapter 15, so the words of Christ abide in us transforming everything about us. Disciples of Jesus now trust the truth of Jesus and view that we view the world around us through the lens of God's word. As we abide in Jesus, we read, we hear, we study, we understand, we memorize, we meditate on his word and he molds our minds to become like his. And we're continually, as a result, being renewed in knowledge after the image of our creator. You think about Romans chapter 12 talks about the transformation that happens in our lives as the disciples. And Paul says there, don't be conformed any longer to the power of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? Of your mind. As we read, study the word, or taught the word, then we begin to grow into the image of Christ more and more because we begin to think more like Christ. Our mind begins to be transformed by his word. To use language from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, we begin to take every thought captive in obedience to Christ. Christ is literally transforming the way we think. And the more we know him, the more we receive his word, the more we think like he thinks, the more we begin to think Christianly. So disciples think differently than the rest of the world. Now this, this doesn't happen automatically, like just like that. You're all all thinking like Christ and his word is totally determining everything you think. Like that happens gradually. That's why the first mark of a disciple, transformed heart, happens at a point in time that then triggers a process whereby that transformation begins to take over every facet of our lives, starting with our minds, where we begin to think according to his word. That then leads to, so third mark of a disciple is a transformed affection or transformed affections. So not just the way we think is transformed by Christ in us, but the way we feel is transformed by Christ in us. Disciples are deeply satisfied, desiring what Jesus desires. This is so key because I think many times we have a hard time connecting our faith and our emotions. 
So on one hand, we are tempted to connect them in a way that's unhealthy. Like faith is just dependent on emotion. And however we feel, just kind of go up and down. Our faith goes up and down with our emotions. On the other hand, oftentimes we have a tendency to disconnect faith from emotions. And we just say, well, I want my faith just to be focused on my mind and not on our feeling. And so there's, there's lack of feeling in our faith, neither of which God has designed for us. He's not designed us for you know, us to be on a roller coaster of emotions and our faith just going up and down according to that roller coaster. He's also not designed for us to disconnect faith from our emotions. The picture that we see in Scripture is when you trust in Christ, it affects affects your emotions. He transforms your affections. You begin to desire him, delight in him. So following Christ is not just about duty. It's about delight and joy. That's the whole, the whole point. Like our pursuit of, of peace and joy in life has led us where? It's led us to Jesus. Jesus is the source of peace, joy, and life for us. He's not just saved us from our sin. He's satisfied our souls. What does John 6 say? Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. Come to me and eat from me, and you will never be hungry again. Come to me and drink from me. You'll never be thirsty again. So the beauty of the New Testament, when the New Testament teaches about discipleship, is that Jesus doesn't just save us. He satisfies us. Which then think about the implications of that. Disciples, then, we grow to participate in spiritual disciplines, not out of a sense of duty, but out of a sense of delight. So we, we worship, not because we have to, because we want to. We want to exalt God. We pray. Why? Because we crave communion with God. Why? Why do we fast? Because we hunger for God more than even food. Why do we confess sins? Because we're grateful for the opportunity to confess sins. Why do we do mission? Because we love God's glory more than we love our own lives. So this is where I would just ask you to examine your own heart and life as a disciple of Jesus. Uh, do you participate in spiritual discipline, worship, prayer, Bible study, fasting, witnessing, evangelism even, out of a sense of duty or out of a sense of delight? And if, if you say duty, that doesn't mean you're not a disciple. But it does mean God desires for you to grow in experiencing delight in Him. To, with the psalmist, be able to say, Oh God, you're my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I've seen you in the sanctuary. I've beheld your power and your glory. Your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I'll praise you as long as I live. My soul will be satisfied in you as with the richest of foods. Like, for that to be our heart. That's what God desires. He desires for us. And then it's a glorious truth that God desires for you and me to be satisfied in Him. So let's not live for anything less than that. Let's live for joy and peace and life and satisfaction and delight in Him. Disciples are designed by God to have a transformed affections, to love Him more than we love the things of this world. So love for God will push out love for the things of God. This world. You start to think about how this uh, affects the way we fight sin in our lives. Oftentimes, I would say every time we sin, it's because we believe that doing this is going to be better for us. It's going to be more fulfilling for us than do, doing things our way. is going to be better, more fulfilling, uh, more desirous than doing things God's way. And so we do what we think is going to bring joy or satisfaction only to find that it doesn't. So how do you resist sin? You resist sin with superior satisfaction in God, superior delight in God. You realize, no, it's always better. It's always more satisfying for me to do His way, to do, live according to His word. And then when we're tempted by sin that says, do this, it'll satisfy you. No, no, no. I know that's not going to satisfy. Like, He can satisfy. So the more we're satisfied in God, the more victory we have in sin against sin in our lives. So disciples, I have a transformed heart at the core of who we are that begins to transform our mind, our affections. Keep going out. Next, transformed will. Fourth mark of a disciple, a transformed will. Disciples are humbly obedient. They do what Jesus commands. So John chapter 15, as Jesus is talking about abiding in him, he says, abide in me, abide in my love, 
and you keep my commandments as you abide in my love. The whole picture is a life that says, I want to obey him. It's the overflow of abiding in him and enjoying his love. So put it all together. As in our minds, we're filled with his word, with our desires, we're satisfied in him. That then leads us to obey him, to see imperatives in the scriptures, commands in the scriptures as invitations from Christ to experience the joy of life as, he, as he's designed us to experience it, to walk according to his word and have him conform our ways to his will. Whoever abides in him ought to walk in the way in which he walked. First John chapter 2, verse 6. So the disciple of Jesus has a transfer will. We do what Jesus says, which then leads. So I want to finish this out, and then I want to think about some implications of this. So fifth mark of a disciple flowing from that is transform relationships. So disciples are sacrificially loving. They serve, they love as Jesus serves and loves. So Christ in us obviously begins to affect the way we relate to others around us. So we've been we've been reconciled to God through Christ, so we now continually work toward reconciliation with others in Christ. We're forgiving one another freely, serving one another selflessly. We lay down our lives as members of local churches to love one another in those churches. And then that compassion of Christ in us begins to expand beyond the local church as we care for our families, the global church, the lost, the poor. You look all throughout Scripture, you'll see a mark of a disciple. First John chapter 3, a mark of a disciple is they love one another. They lay down their lives for other people. They love their neighbor as themselves. Second commandment Jesus gives us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So you see that mind, will, heart, affections, focused on loving him. And then flowing from that is a love for others. Disciples are sacrificially loving. We have transformed relationships. That's the fifth mark. And then all that leads to the sixth mark of a disciple. And I want us to put all this together. Sixth mark of a disciple is a transformed purpose. Disciples are missionally engaged. They make disciples who make disciples of all nations. So this is where you put Matthew 4 and 28 together. So follow me, Jesus says. Fundamentally, what does it mean to be a disciple? It means you're a follower of Jesus. And when you follow him, Jesus says, I will make you fishers of men. Which is interesting. So from the very beginning, to be a follower of Christ is to be a fisher for men. To to be on mission with Christ. Then you look at the very end, and what did Jesus say to his disciples? Now you go and you make disciples of all nations. So to be a follower of Christ, to be a disciple of Jesus, is to make disciples of Jesus. So this is for every follower of Christ. We, as disciples, are intended to be disciple makers. As followers, are intended to be fishers. So... Compelled by God's grace, disciples of Jesus are captivated by God's great commission. Jesus has not just transformed the way we live. He's revolutionized our entire reason for living. We live and die to share the gospel of Christ, to see the life of Christ reproduced in others, to teach the word of Christ to others, to serve the world for Christ by praying for, giving to, going to people around us, people around the world for the sake of God's name. This is why every disciple lives. This isn't just for a special group of disciples. We are all called to make disciples of the nations. So let's, let's put this together. A couple of implications. Uh, one, notice how in scripture what we see is Christ in us transforms us from the inside out. And so if we're going to grow as disciples, we need to constantly come back to the core of what it means to be in him, to be forgiven of our sins, to have repented and believed in Christ. This is why the gospel is so key. and We must preach the gospel to ourselves constantly, remind ourselves we're in Christ not because of our own merit, because of his mercy, that he has indwelled us with his spirit, that his spirit lives inside of us. We're forgiven of our sins. We're children of his. He's adopted us as, our, as his children. He is our father. To live out of the overflow of that, to realize this is my identity. This is who I am. To continually come back to that, to rise every morning, realizing who you are in Christ, who he's made you to be. He has transformed your heart. And then flowing from that. So to say, God, then transform my mind. 
Lord, help me to think more like you and to get into the word toward that end, to read his word, to study his word, to memorize his word, to meditate on his word. It's what it means to be a disciple, to let his word abide in us and transform the way we think, that it just flows from us, that it flows through our mouths, that it flows in every thought, every decision we make is being led and guided by his word. And then that begins to transform our affections. We begin to not just follow Christ out of duty, but out of delight. We begin to want him desire Him, love Him, enjoy Him, walk with Him, and all the emotions that go with that, but our affections are now driven by Christ, which then affects the way the decisions we make and the way we turn from sin and the way we obey Him. Why? Because we know from His Word what He's called us to do and we desire to do what He wants us to do. We have a transformed mind, transformed affection that leads to transformed will. This is so important. Many times when we... Think about our battles with sin. And I'll take credit for, for the negative part of this as a pastor speaking to people. So often I've just said, when it comes to sin, just stop doing that or start doing that. And yes, yeah, there's a place where we need to talk about the will and decisions we make, but if we don't realize that our decisions we make are based on our minds and our affections, then we'll never really be able to battle sin out here when it comes to our will. Think about it. Think about Genesis 3, the very first sin in the world. So they ate a piece of fruit in disobedience to God. That was the decision they made. But that battle with sin started right far long before they ate that piece of fruit. Well, you look at the beginning of that chapter, and what does it say? The serpent came to Eve and said, did God really say and causes Eve and Adam to question God's word? So you see the battle of the mind there. Is God's word really true? Is God really good? Does he desire what's best for us? And that led to desire. When they saw that the fruit was, was appealing, pleasing to the eye, they wanted to taste it. So there's a desire there that then led them to eat the piece of fruit. Well, it all started with a mind doubting the goodness of God and the word of God and desires to begin to turn away from all the great things they had in God. And all of a sudden they started thinking, well, that apple looks better. That piece of fruit looks better. And so they ate it and they disobeyed God. So how do you and I fight sin? Yes, we need to tell ourselves, don't do this. So think about any struggles that you or I have with sin. We keep kind of going back to it. Well, why do we keep going back to it? What needs to happen in our minds, where we begin to fill our mind. What does Psalm 119 say? How can we keep our ways pure? By living according to your word. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. We need, what does God's word say about the struggle with sin? How do I meditate on God's word? How do I fill my mind with God's word? And then God changed my desires, so I don't desire that. So replace those desires with desires for you, for your glory, for your goodness, for holiness, for things that are better, and to focus on those desires, and then to let that lead to this battle of the will out here by a transformed mind, transformed affections that lead to change in the way we live and the decisions we make, then lead to changes in our relationships. And then, so last circle, this transformed purpose, Disciples missionally engaged. Disciples make disciples of all the nations. I'm convinced that this is one of the greatest uh, misunderstandings in the church, particularly when it comes to mission. So let me close with a, a story here. When I was uh, in college and in seminary, I was looking in Scripture, and I see God's passion for His glory among the nations all over Scripture. And... Uh, I start learning about the world and how many people in the world have never heard the gospel. And I start thinking, well, then I need to be a missionary. This is a no-brainer. Like, the gospel's got to be made known among the nations. There's many people in the nations who've never heard the gospel. It's, i gotta, I got to go overseas. And so I start talking to my wife about that. Uh, and so she's saying the same thing. And so we were in seminary, and uh, the president of the International Mission Board, which I now have the privilege of leading at that time, his name was Jerry Rankin, and he was coming to our campus to preach, and I had been asked to take him to breakfast that morning. And so I took him to breakfast, and, I, and the night before, I told my wife, I said, listen, I'm taking the president of IMB, who oversees all this international missions, uh, to breakfast. I'm going to tell him we're ready to go overseas. Uh, is that okay with you? And she said, yeah, that's great. 
Uh, so go for it. So, so I take him to breakfast, and we sit down. As soon as we sit down, I just start pouring out my heart and say, I see this in the Word. I see the need for the gospel in the world. So I, I, my wife and I are ready to be missionaries. And Dr. Rankin looked back at me, and for about 30 seconds, he encouraged me in what I had just said to him. But then he spent the rest of breakfast, for about an hour, he spent the rest of breakfast talking to me about the need for pastors who lead churches here in America to shepherd those churches, lead those churches for the spread of the gospel to those who've never heard before. And that's what he talked about. He talked about the need for people to stay here. And I was so confused. Like I, I went home that night and Heather was like, well, how did it go? And uh, I said, I think the president of the IMB just talked me out of becoming a missionary. And I couldn't figure out why. And she was like, well, what did you say? I said, I don't know. I don't know why. But here's what I'm so thankful for. And that conversation that day with, with Dr. Rankin, because what he did was he created a category in my mind that I don't think was there before. And it's a category that should have been there, uh, but for some reason I had totally missed. So the category was a, a person, so a type of person who is passionate about the spread of the gospel to the nations, but who doesn't go overseas as a missionary. So there's actually somebody who can be passionate about the spread of the gospel to the nations, but doesn't go overseas as a missionary. And I just thought, well, if you're passionate about the spread of the gospel to the nations, then you become a missionary. But then I started thinking, well, what does that mean for everybody else who doesn't go overseas as a missionary? Does that mean we're not passionate about the spread of the gospel to the nations? Nobody else? Only those who are passionate about the spread of the gospel go to the nations? No, no wait a second. Passion for the spread of the gospel to the nations? That's not just for missionaries. That's for every single follower of Christ. This is what it means to be a Christian. You have the Spirit of Christ in you. And the Spirit of Christ, we saw it in the last message. The Spirit of Christ wants the world for Christ. So, do you have the Spirit of Christ in you as a Christian? Well, then, do you want the world for Christ? Do you have the Spirit of Christ? He wants the world for Christ. Of course you do. I, I pray you do. And so this is the reality. We have this tendency to look at mission as, well, that's for missionaries. Instead of, no, mission is for followers of Christ. Every disciple of Jesus has been created, called by God to be a part of making the gospel known to the ends of the earth among the nations. So this is where I want to challenge you as a disciple of Jesus. Yes, to, to live in this reality of a transformed heart. Jesus has put his spirit inside of you. He's forgiven you of all your sin. So let him transform your mind and your affections and your will and your relationships and ultimately let him transform your understanding of the very reason, the purpose you're on this planet. You are here as a disciple of Jesus to make disciples of the nations, to be a part of a global plan for the spread of the gospel to the ends of the earth. That is not just for missionaries. That is for every disciple of Jesus. It's there from the very beginning. Follow me. I'll make you a fisher of men. It's there at the very end. Disciples, every one of you, go make disciples of the nations. And so this is what it means means to be a disciple of Jesus. It means to live, to breathe, to make disciples of the nations. So how do we do that? We'll look in the next message. But may God give us grace to realize that disciple making among the nations, global mission is not just for a few people. It's for every single one of us as followers of Jesus. So let's, let's pray. God, thank you for uh, the glorious reality of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, what it means to be forgiven of all of our sin, to be, to be indwelled by your spirit and to be a part of seeing this transformation happen in our lives. God, I pray for myself. I pray for those who are listening. I pray that this reality of transformation would, would just grow more and more every day. Help us to think more like you. Help us to desire you more. Help us to obey you more. Help us to love as you love more and more and more. And God, pray you would help us to be faithful in the purpose that you've given to us. Help us to make disciples. And especially as we prepare to look in the next message, Lord, help us to know what it means to make disciples and help us to do it. Help us to obey. Help us to fish for men. Help us to make disciples who make disciples of all the nations, that others might know the glorious riches of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.